The Aquarium models are currently missing the music, well, as it were, after the Metropolitan Police in London detained the former Senate Deputy President, Dr. Ike Equiremado, and his wife, Beatrice, and charged them with conspiracy to facilitate the travel of another person for organ harvesting in the UK. The victim, whose travel was facilitated to the UK by the suspects, was said to be a homeless 15-year-old boy. However, the question on people's lips is, how were they able to leave the country with the boy after passing through the rigorous process of applying for a passport from the Nigerian Immigration Service, among other stringent measures taken before leaving the country. Could it be that the Immigration Service didn't do its due diligence before issuing the passport to the young boy in question? Joining us on this show this morning as we discuss the case of the Equity models and other questions around passport issuance in Nigeria is Mohamed Babandede, former Controller General of Nigeria Immigration Service. Welcome to the morning show, Mr. Babandede. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Is good that morning. Ruben? Yes, good morning. Thank you for joining us, sir. Well, quickly. Doctor, me, how are you? I'm fine, sir. Now, let me ask. Uh, there's been this story that uh, there are irregularities on, at the end of Nigerian immigration here uh, in the Ekwere Madu case that is still unfolding in the UK. Uh, what could that possibly be? Some people have talked about the boy's age. Isn't anybody entitled to a passport? And where would the discrepancy about age come from, considering the fact that these days uh, Nigerians have uh, NIN, the national identification number that is even now imprinted on uh, uh, passports. What, could you, what do you think could be the issue uh, from the immigration uh, side of it, either at the point of uh, passport issuance or at the uh, departure uh, uh, ports uh, in Nigeria here? Well, uh, thank you very much for putting me on the line. Uh, you know, I'm a senior citizen, uh, Ruben, uh, not very much interested in talking about controversies, but I will be very specific to you that this issue is a case of trafficking issue, not only passport. Passport is only a supplementary issue on the matter. Uh, the Metropolitan Police are accusing Mr. and Mrs. Ekmerudu for trafficking a person for organ harvesting. And when we talk of trafficking, there are many issues involved. We are talking about the act itself, we are talking about the process, we are talking the purpose involved. So you need to analyze this before you even talk about the passport. Uh, trafficking simply means you take a person from a place to another place by force with intent of exploitation. You can see the three issues involved. The activity, the main purpose of person who has been taken or whether it is taken by force or voluntarily. So the issue is that even if that person uh, was a child, let's assume uh, like it has been circulated because we can't say because it is in the court of law. Uh, the truth of the matter is that what you declare to immigration is what immigration gives you. If that passport is fresh passport that has been issued, uh, a person comes as a child, applied for a passport as an adult, brings document, there's a false declaration. That's an offense under Immigration Act. But how will the immigration know if he, his name number is correct, if he has a declaration in court? What do you require? Is it not age declaration, which sometimes is not verified? So at the third end, immigration issue passport to him as an adult if he's a child. But if the passport is reissued, that's where the contention is with the immigration. If the person had a passport before and had come to immigration and said, look, change my data, change my age because I want to travel, that could be a big issue for discussion, that it was intended deliberately to make the, that person a child so that the person can be able to travel, or deliberately to make that person an adult when the person is a, a child so that he can look like an adult for the purpose of exploitation. So there are a lot of issues involved, and I don't want you to look at it as a passport issue. The first issue is trafficking, and I said the activities, who recruited him, who transported him, who uh, uh, handed him over to somebody for self-keeping. That is the first activity. The second activity, you need to know, uh, very important, uh, the, the purpose of why he's uh, exploited and the means uh, and the reason. If the, he is taken by force, if the person is taken by force, 
even if it is a child or an adult is irrelevant but if it is a child the consent of the child is irrelevant so that's why the uk issue is involved if we can prove that that person left nigeria as a child and a passport was obtained to him as an adult even though he's a child it means there was deceit there was forgery there was also the issue of that his consent was irrelevant even if he had given consent, he wanted to donate, because I've seen a letter circulating in the social media, which says that Ekme Redu has given a letter to British High Commission, uh, High Commission that he wanted to take him out in terms of transplant, which means a consent is there from the adult. So in trafficking, even if it, he was an adult, he gave the consent. And if the consent was given under deceit, it could still be handled in the UK as a case of trafficking. The worst is if that person is a child, as it's been circulated, that the child was 15 years old, somebody forged the password in Nigeria. I think it depends on the cooperation between Nigeria and the UK. Thank you very much, sir. As you've you know, alluded to, so much of this case is still in the realms of speculation. So I want to take you to how this case could potentially affect Nigerians in general with a Nigerian passport in terms of getting visas, in terms of extra scrutiny at different ports of entry around the world since part of this speculation is that there was a passport that was fraudulently obtained. How would that affect the general Nigerian public? No, I think, uh, Chairman, you are trying to uh, arise, you are trying to raise the issue of passport as an issue. Remember, the case in the UK is not about document. It's about trafficking in person for organ harvesting. And I said the three elements of trafficking must be looked at. First, the activity. Who are the people who recruited him? Who are the people who moved him? Who are the people who give him accommodation? Who are the people who took him over? You see, this aspect is there. Second aspect, which is key in trafficking, which we need to look at, is the issue of force. Was the person forced to travel? Because that is trafficking is important. If he is a child, the force is irrelevant. Even if the child said, look, I want to go and donate a, a kidney uh, to so-so person, that consent becomes irrelevant. Yes, so I don't want you cannot, to look at the passport child issue first. The child does not have capacity to give consent. But there is an issue here with regards to passports, which you mentioned yourself, that they could have presented, could have presented false documents to the Nigerian Immigration Service. So that, I've set that aside. I'm talking about how generally this might affect Nigerians in terms of extra scrutiny at ports of entry. Will it affect Nigerians or will it not? In terms of getting visas to other countries, will it affect it, Nigerians it, or will it not? No, 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 no. This is not, that's why I said it is only Nigerian media that is going to raise the issue as a passport issue. It's a case of trafficking. We should look at issues of trafficking as a passport issue. It's not a passport issue that is an issue. Even if it were an adult, let's assume the person who went to the UK was an adult and he had given his correct age as an adult and he went to UK as an adult, but later run to Metropolitan Police and said, look, I'm an adult, but they deceived me that uh, I'm not going to uh, give my kidney or liver. Uh, no, they said that when I come, I'll be given good residence, I'll be given a palace, I'll be given this, and he accepted, only to find out that it is the deceit. So that is where the problem is. It's not the issue of passport, it's the issue of trafficking. And I want you Nigerians to identify issue of trafficking and documentation. In trafficking, uh, in parliament document, exploitation has been, organ harvesting has been added to exploitation. And that organ harvesting is a big business in the world, almost $1.5 billion annually for people who give their uh, their kidney or liver by force. So please, I don't want you to see that affecting Nigerians. It will not affect Nigerians. Documentation is fine. The only problem is how do we take consent? We are dealing with the kidney issue. We don't have transplant capacity in Nigeria. The Nigerian government has no legislation to say, look, before you leave Nigeria, immigration must see a letter from a doctor. Uh, look, I'm taking this person for kidney transplant. Has doctor matched the liver and kidney of the person who is you are going to donate? Is it done voluntarily? Uh, has procedures been issued by doctor? That is the key. If that is not done, people should not be allowed to depart, but not passport. Please, even if the palm's house is a child or another, to me, it's not relevant. It will not affect Nigerian okay. travel abroad. Okay. So I'd like to ask you this because I know, and correct me if I'm wrong, when you check with the airlines, you get your plane ticket, you move to the immigration, and you go through a short interview from the immigration before you pass through security 
and you go to a place where you have to board your plane. My question to you is, what kind of questions does the immigration ask us at that point? And couldn't they have picked up a case yes. from questioning the said person at that point before you move over to securities? There are no departure restrictions in Nigeria against a person who is an adult, except if he's wanted by law enforcement. Uh, this is very clear. That person left as an adult, according to the information available to us. So if an adult is traveling, the only things you need to look at as an immigration when he's leaving the country, does the person has travel document that is admittable in the country he's departing? When I say travel document, passport and visa, if he's going to Ghana, does he have a valid passport? If he's going to UK, does he have a UK visa? And is genuine. If it's genuine, you allow the person to go. You have no right to stop him. We had instances where we have court cases where we stop people when the law did not allow it to do. So journalists should not say so, we should support that. But if it is children with a mismatch, we can interview because the child first. I give you an example. If Chief Ekmerudu was traveling together with a child with a different name, uh, and immigration officers can ask. Oga, how are you traveling with a 12 year child who is not your age and who is, has no name with you? Oh, he will say, Oh, it's my son, brother, blah, blah. They have the right to stop because they suspect that child will not be safe. But that is not so. That person left with a valid age for travel, with a valid visa. According to the information given to us, the passport given to uh, him was genuine, the visa given to him by the UK was genuine. So the issue is the deception. You know, when the UK government realized that uh, probably this person had decided to go and donate uh, an organ uh, and they realized that he was deceived, uh, that he had no intention to give genuinely, or they realized that, look, the age of the person is, does not match the age on the password. That is why the problem is. So the investigation has to be done discreetly. I don't want to mention many issues because the factors are there for immigration in Nigeria and Her Majesty's Immigration Service to work together and find out if the password had been altered, if the passport had been changed, if data has been uh, amended. All this can be done. But I don't want to give those details in the media because investigation is going on with the police. My duty is not to jeopardize investigation by the police. Uh, one of the reasons that the Ekwere Madrus have been remanded in custody has to do with the issue of jurisdiction for the uh, Attorney General in the UK to address that. Uh, but in any case, we're also told that uh, the bigger part of the uh, allegations, uh, you know, occurred in the United Kingdom. But are there aspects of this matter uh, that the Nigerian authorities can also investigate? And what should be those aspects? And even if there is a trial in the UK, uh, there are issues also, uh, you know, for Nigeria uh, as, as a state uh, to address. Instead of a British High Commission yes, just I going to first, visit the Ekure Madus. Yes, I think first, uh, UK is very lucky. In a transnational organized crime of this nature, especially trafficking, is it difficult for you to have the victims and the suspect together? UK is lucky today. It has the victims. It has the suspect. It is even having the patients involved. So uh, investigation is much easy. And Nigeria and UK are all signatories to Transnational Crimes Convention on top 2000, which Nigeria signed, which UK signed, which contained the Palermo Protocol. And in the Palermo Protocol, there is mutual legal assistance among countries on issues of trafficking. So I don't see any problem of Nigerian government cooperating with the UK government to check if the age of the person that traveled for the purpose of transplant was altered or wrongly given. If they have a scientific fact which says that they have determined the age, because now you can do that, uh, you, can, you can determine the age of the person without documentation. If they check the documentation scientifically and say, look, this person is a child, then things have changed. It is left for immigration to find out the document submitted. Whoever submitted that document to immigration by saying that that person is an adult has also committed an offense under Immigration Act and regulation because they have given false information to immigration and that person can be prosecuted on the Nigerian side. So in a transnational organized crime investigation, a joint investigation is required on this matter where all those who are involved in committing the offense will be punished. But I'm glad to state that the child is a key issue in trafficking. In Palermo Protocol, it is clearly stated that consent of the child is irrelevant. 
Uh, but the UK government has not domesticated that side of child issue in trafficking laws, but also it will be handled in other issues. But as far as I'm concerned, there are opportunities to punish people. But also we should look at the situation. Uh, also, he has a daughter who is sick. Uh, he didn't traffic for exploitation or to make money. Uh, also, it is not justified to exploit the children's other people's children to, 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 to make your child ha happy. Uh, we need to find out if the consent was given by adult. Very important key for you to understand that many Nigerians give many reasons to get asylum. I also read the other side of it that this guy is an adult. He ran to the place to complain for asylum due to other reasons. If I tell you the number of Nigerians who declared asylum in the UK, you'll be shocked. And if I tell you the reasons they give, you'll be amazed. Any reason. Many people have declared that Fulani Hatsman has killed them, Boko Haram has killed them, IPOP has killed them, uh, their family. Many reasons. Some of them are 99 percent. So we need to be fair to also uh, the family of Ekumeru to also, to also consider that there is a child lying down looking for it, assistance to survive. I think UK will look at all those issues. That's an extremely important point that you made there, the importance to just be fair and stress that a lot of this is still in the realm of speculation. So I want to just segue to a different topic now, that of border security, sir. Can you tell us what the Nigerian Immigration um, Service has been able to do improvements-wise with regards to our national security. We also have a huge problem with illegal immigration here in Nigeria. As many Nigerians are trying to run away to other um, countries, people are trying to flood our country illegally. And we have that problem that of porous borders. And the National Immigration Service does have an uphill task. What advances have been made in terms of technology, in terms of manpower, in terms of training that you would like to specifically point out? Well, I'm not in the position to speak of Niger about Nigerian immigrants. You can see me in Mopti. I've retired. I'm a senior citizen. But I know before we left and things have continued, we have done a lot to improve the documentation and airport travel is key. First documentation, the NIN identification is key. Uh, to unifying identity in Nigeria. You know, the biggest problem, Nigerians have multiple identities. When I was on board, when I said I want NIN to be a key issue, I, I, we had editorial saying that this was not possible. But today, NIN is required for passport, and people are trying to force government to also ensure NIN is connected with GSM. So a single identity for Nigerian is key for Nigerian government. I am highly encouraged and highly impressed when Mr. President has force NIMSI to ensure there is one equal identity system. If you said you are a Nigerian citizen, you are the same person who has a driving license, you are the same person who has a passport, you are the same person who has a bank account, you are the same person who has all identity. This is good process for Nigeria to continue. But the other issue is airport travel. We have improved by downloading passport document system into the uh, passport. So if you reissue your passport uh, or you lost your passport fake, UK government will know. Uh, now, the system is very clear. Well, if you, your passport is lost and you are traveling with a lost passport or you change the passport deliberately, UK government will know because we have uploaded it into the PKD database and it's also in the Interpol database. Uh, so I'm glad Nigeria has improved. But a lot has to be done in terms of people who are traveling for organ harvest. You know, we have a lot of kidney issues. I'm coming from Jigawa, in Hadeja in particular. We have high level of kidney transplant uh, in, in Jigawa. And a lot of people, most one or two our relatives have traveled. Government needs to look for this rule because donor issues are key. Nigerian government needs to start thinking of legislation of donor happening globally uh, in terms of kidney transplant. I, have, I know in part of Europe, <coughs> people who are dying, people who are old, who are sick, they give voluntarily their, 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 their organs for them to be used for other people. Also, people also voluntarily donate. People sell organs. We should legislate against that. So that we we'll make sure organs are only given to relatives to ensure there is the love, there is social relationship between the donor and uh, uh, the recipient. So I think a lot has to be done in terms of donation, in terms of people who travel out for donor harvest. Otherwise, trafficking of harvest will continue. I tell you, it's a big business in the world today. Uh, it generates almost 1.5 billion annually. And science has improved that things could be changed. Our, our kidney, our liver can be changed. 
so with the time going on, trafficking will continue. The highest countries with this okay. uh, donor uh, trafficking, uh, it's not even Nigeria. We are talking about China, we are talking about Pakistan, we are talking about Egypt, we are talking about uh, other countries. <coughs> but no, Nigeria is not included, but because we don't have the statistics. Okay. So government has to be very, very okay. careful to ensure that those who are going for medical are regulated. Okay, sir. So two things. Number one for me will be, you said something that when somebody comes to the immigrations to get a passport, he can bring a declaration of age, which might be false, and the passport office might not know about it. So I'd like to ask one step further. Is there a provision that we can have a forensic team to even authenticate the veracity of the documents? Because if I can just bring a declaration of age, then I can just type it somewhere and say somebody that's wherever signs it, and I bring it, and it's accepted. So is there a forensic team to look into that? And secondly, is there sort of like an archive process in Nigeria that at least can give the immigration officers access to birth data, birth, I mean birth certificates, you know, for different hospitals and government offices, you know, archived somewhere that as they look at your, your, your papers, for processing your visa, I mean your passport, they can just key into it and type in your name and it brings out your government authenticated birth record. Do we have that archiving system in Nigeria? I think you raise two fundamental issues. Let me talk about immigration verifying to ensure the document they correct is genuine is a key issue, but it's a big task for immigration. I think you should look at the other end of it police report and affidavit. I think that's the key issue to do, mm. look at. Uh, can somebody be allowed just to walk in to a court and say, look, I, my age is so so when you are like 60 years old or you are 40 years old or even you are a young person who has been born at the time when re registration has started. So age registration is a key to Nigeria, but unfortunately, or fortunately for most of us, especially in rural areas who are born, our date of birth has not been and I want to tell you the number of people who are getting passport and document in Nigeria is less than 10%. A lot of people in rural area have no documentation at all. So I think we need to handle these issues in terms of birth and death registration. Uh, you are even looking at birth. There may be people who are traveling with the dead people passport. <laughs> you get my point? So uh, this documentation is key. Government, government needs to invest in terms of birth registry and death registry with a single database. But what the government is doing with the NIL is a great thing to do. Uh, if, if Nigerians cooperate and government invest honestly in it, where all your identity is one, if I put your passport, I will see all your driving license. Why should you have a different age with your passport number, with your driving license number? So I am not looking for immigration to verify, but that should be the beginning of the system. Uh, we can start. It's not late. Government can pass legislation that today nobody should, uh, uh, should refuse to register a child. Uh, uh, we are looking for the future of Nigeria. We are not looking for the problem now. We we'll ensure that before you get any tr document, before you get ticket, you must have NIN number. People will cry about the passport. But that is good documentation. So that by the time when it comes to immigration, immigration put the system there is automation, it will link to the national ecosystem, that is yeah. NIMSI, to see that whether this information is correct. So I think this is the key issue. But we have forensic officers, but a lot of issues also will do with the corruption, with the power, the use of power. In trafficking, it says the use of power. If I'm a former controller general, I say, give me a document, an officer's issue document, is you use your power for, to force things to happen. This has to be looked at. But when you talk about uh, having a central database, I think is the best thing that country can do. We can use the NIL. We can enforce birth and death registration at the local level and with central database. If we do that, Nigeria will be better, will be more secure. Nobody will carry arms and walk around and kill people. He has a telephone, he's making calls, we cannot identify him. Nobody can come and break a door, you take a fingerprint, you cannot identify him. I think this is the key to development. Well, you, you talked about government introducing <coughs> legislation, particularly with regard to registration and all that. But there are some people who are saying that we are at this point, in this particular case, because uh, Nigeria is not uh, developed in terms of health infrastructure. If it were possible to do kidney transplant in Nigeria, maybe all of this would not have happened. You think that the problem really is the failure of the medical system in Nigeria 
now compelling people who can afford to do so, going to India, going to US, going to UK, to seek, uh, you know, uh, uh, medical care. Not even for something as serious as kidney, even for toothache. People go to the UK to go and uh, treat themselves. But before then, before the legislation, uh, before we have the hospitals right, it doesn't stop us from making a small legislation. The Minister of Interior can make a regulation under the Immigration Act to say nobody will go out for kidney or transplant until he has this requirement. The requirement involves a medical certificate stating that there is a match between the donor and the giver. There is consent that the person has given the, uh, uh, the, the, the promise to donate through goodwill. But if this document is, I'm supposed to have has this document, he carries it on, and they found that it's a false. It's fine. And I'm surprised the British High Commission uh, is complaining about uh, the age. If, 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 if they can easily ask immigration, immigration can help them. Uh, on this documentation. So what we require is just small legislation to make sure people are committed and people are educated that don't tell people to sell. Because it's possible. This is, might be happening. It's because it is UK. Little bit more organized society. People are going to India. People, a lot. People are going to Egypt for transplant. Who knows who carries who to those places? You know, And nobody can uh, report this. So we need to have a legislation. We need have to have training. We need to have uh, re-engineering of the officers so that they really Make sure these things are happening. The best transplant donor, even globally, is to give to your relation. If you carry somebody who has no relation with you, you know, it can raise, raise a lot of suspicion whether it has been bought. But you know, Nigerian can even sell. Some people can decide to sell as a business, <laughs> to sell kidney by themselves. But that consent is not guaranteed if, if, if it is given under deception. Because it's a trafficking issue we're talking about. It's not guaranteed if it's given under deception. It is zero if it is a child who gives the consent, even if his parents agree. So these are the issues we need to do, small legislation to solve the problem. Well, can we get an idea of how prevalent this problem of trafficking really is? And you would know, seeing as you were formerly in the immigration service, I mean, there must have been a lot of situations where you have followed an attempt at trafficking. How bad is this problem in Nigeria? Well, I'm also a founding father of NAPTIC. I was a director in charge of NAPTIC. Uh, I have also been a controller general in and after retirement, I have also found a new NGO sure for you to tackle this issue of trafficking as well. The situation is bad, uh, especially in Nigeria. You know, it becomes a concern uh, to us, the media, when it is global. But internally, it's a big issue. How many children are under servitude in the cities working for media men like you, or me, it's a public servant, or uh, rich men who are exploited, they work day and night, they are paid less money. Uh, they are under subjugation, they are abused. How many children? There are many. So yeah. it's a big issue. Uh, legislation alone cannot solve. We need to improve labor. We need to educate people. We make sure there is rule and law. Look at the case of Almajiri, child we have it, like in North Nigeria. It's a big issue. Uh, it's easy product to pick uh, because he's already on the street looking for food. The person who's looking for food, if you give him something, he will go for anything. He can be recruited. So it's a big issue. Trafficking is a big issue and it's a supplier for a lot of criminality globally and within Nigeria. Right. So in having this National Archive and Data Bank, I'd like to ask you, what role can the local governments play in Nigeria? Because, correct me if I'm wrong, sir, I understand that most of the initial birth records, are the government records of births are issued by the first line local government areas where these births occur. Correct me if I'm wrong, sir. Is it something that they can lift those data from those local governments of either to issue out vet records and digitize them to start with as a first line item. Yes, UNICEF is doing a lot in terms of birth registration. Uh, there's a lot of investment. Uh, it's a key issue, it's a key strategy in the UNICEF country office in Nigeria uh, to encourage local legislation. But you know, the issue involved is if you say archive. Uh, People will change. The issue is changing even data. When I was in service, I refused to the best of my life to change data of people. Even when you document, even when you register, some people will come and say, Look, I want to change my age because my father told me that uh, it's not my correct birth. Somebody would like to change all his entire name. I, 
have refused since I left service at, at five years plus I was a controller general I cannot remember doing two I've seen a person who has lived in US for five years came to me and said he changed he wants to change his entire data I said I don't know the crime you committed in the US or in, in, in Canada or in the UK with those name now you want to change and he will have affidavit and you see big men following them to say look support him help him or because he wants to play football so the issue is not only even registration it's strict measures not to change in 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 in, in NIMSI it's much even easier to change data you know right. so if we even if, if we document uh, it's like you are uh, uh, you, you are packaging your house very well at the beginning and destroying it at the end <laughs> regularly so there has to be a strategy to make sure there is local registration right some people are doing it even in the countries where they don't have ID card. I went to my primary school because it's not area of contention. I found my attendance register because it's not a contention. But the bus registry and is a contention. People will argue and argue with it against it. So please let there be a deliberate attempt. Everybody looks at the federal government when things are happening. Federal government, they forget about state governors. Most of this activities is a local issue. The hospital are in the state. State legislation is a must to make sure bars and deaths are registered. And when they are registered, let NIMSI or somebody take the data and archive it. It's doable. It's not a rocket science. They have officers in each local government. And these officers are living without taking salary, uh, taking salary without doing anything. So it's doable. It's just the national will to do it. And I hope we can have the will to do it. Well, sir, let's talk about issuance of passport again, but for a different purpose. Now, I understand that uh, the issuance of passport is uh, centralized. Every application for passport has to go from uh, the passport office in the state all the way to Abuja. And then it will be treated centrally in Abuja uh, before that is, uh, you know, uh, the, the issued passports are sent back to uh, the various uh, units. What do you think of this centralization of the operation? Even if we're told that, well, it's, it's a computerized uh, process. But the wait time to get a passport now has uh, increased. Is it not possible? Will you recommend a decentralization of passport issuance? Although now the NI number is put on the passport and all of that, but I don't see how the centralization of the operation is uh, working in terms of time lapse. You know, I, as the immediate past control general, sometimes you find it difficult to talk more about an institution you just left because you have your juniors on ground. Uh, look somehow, but let me make things clearer to you so that you can understand what you are saying. Passport issuance has always been central. What, what I mean by central? If a person appears in a passport office in Canada and put his or her fingerprints to reissue passport or to take fresh, it goes to the central database in Abuja. Such the the, the office search is fingerprint, not patient. It will search to say, look. This person who is issuing password as Mohammed Babadil is the same guy. It will approve the password will be issued in Canada. So it's always central. That's a good thing about it since we introduced this password. We're ahead of many countries in the world. Uh, the second issue is issuance point. There are two different issues. Issuance point is in Canada, when you do the fingerprint, it will allow you to print in Canada. But what the system comes now what they are doing after I left is to reduce the issuance centers. It does not mean that they are issuing in Abuja. No, no, no. The central database remain. The search system stand. What they are doing is to reduce cost of production by putting, for example, three state, four state around Benin, which I think the minister just commissioned, to say that, look, if you apply in uh, Asaba, you put your fingerprint to reissue, it will still go to our central database approved. If it is approved, it will be issued in one center in Benin. Then the physical booklet will be carried to Asaba. I think that's what uh, they are doing now. They are doing that to reduce costs in terms of equipment for uh, the new enhanced password. You know, the new enhanced password is different from the old password we have. Uh, it's polycarbonate. And the machines for producing the polycarbonate is more expensive than uh, the e-passport. I think they are doing it in terms of cost. So that, that misconception that passport is now approved only in Abuja is different. But the challenge immigration has, and I kept saying it before I left, is just lack of enough booklets. Forget about it. The system can produce passport under 24 hours. Anybody can get his passport if the record is okay, if the name is okay. When you think of it, it can be produced 24 hours. There are no enough booklets. If there are enough booklets, the passport can be produced 24 hours. I mean, that's my view, even before I left. So as you, it's not your business where it is printed. As long as you can get your passport 
us at one deal is okay. So the problem is booklets not centralizing or decentralization. Uh, it's a political issue that we are discussing. I told you I don't want to discuss more about it, but uh, the system is good. For the cabinet is enhanced. Uh, the only problem is that there are not enough booklets to handle that. And I don't want to talk, don't ask me about, about booklets, whether they will be available or not. I don't want to discuss about it, but that is a major issue. Well, do you want to talk about cross-border banditry? Because I got a question asking what efforts the Immigration Service has made to curb cross-border bandits that enter Nigeria from neighboring countries to commit banditry, kidnapping, and terrorist activities. I think, uh, otherwise you should stop asking what immigration is doing. I'm a retired person, I cannot know. I've retired since September last year, but I know immigration is key to national security. Because the border is a key to national security. And that's why before we left, we developed border management strategy 2019 to 2023. It's a management strategy which involves enhancing land, sea, and air border. If it is well implemented, it's a document available. Uh, I think if you check uh, immigration, www.immigration.org.ng, you will see the, the border management strategy, uh, which tackle about how to handle porous border. Uh, you know, Nigeria is a unique country with a great challenge. We are not like UK. UK is semi-island. So you invest your control more at airport because you are an island. Coming by sea is more difficult. But Nigeria has a very vast land mass which requires physical and scientific control. Uh, I know before we left, we, we did port operational basis. Uh, there were issues also to ensure that there are e-border control. Although my concern before I left that e-border control cannot work unless you have the infrastructure to take care of the e-border control. If you want to put cameras, scientific things at a booker location, it will be useless. It's a waste of government money resources to do it. So I think uh, we need to re-engineer the thinking we have about controlling our land borders. Uh, we have to do it jointly. We have to strengthen immigration, not only employing, but technology, technology based on the specific locations we have. Lack of electricity, lack of infrastructure has to, to be faced. Uh, I don't want to talk about whether it is succeeding or failing, but I know immigration, when it is enhanced, when capacity is built, when the right people are in the right place, things will change greatly. All right. So I'm still very concerned about, you know, data and everything that goes on with data and touch points. So I'd like to ask, apart from, you know, and this is just us talking generally as regards how we can do data better in the country. Apart from the NIN touch points, which is one database, another one is the BVN touch point and probably the voters card touch point. Is there a possibility of, you know, bringing all this data to, to one touch point so we can all have all of them and it's easier bang on for, you know, acquisition of passport and some other things like we've talked about the bet data and the likes before? It is already the process that government is pursuing. It needs to do it properly and very well. Uh, you don't need to have all identity issuing agencies in one place. Uh, or to have one data for all identity issuing. You don't need to have one data for passport, one data for driver license, one data for BVN, one data for insurance. No. What the ecosystem is saying is that there will be one identity number. Like India. India is doing it. And they have succeeded very well. One national identity number for you. That identity number, will, will, you, will, you, will, you will search the database, central database of it. It means if a person comes to issue a passport or issue passport, you make sure it tally with the central database of need. It's just connectivity. When a person comes to take driver license, you make sure it's that. Voters register, you make sure it is that. I hope voters, politicians will accept that. They make sure it is one identity also. So that you take a uh, voter's card, you make sure it is only that person who has the same name with the passport, who has driving license, is done. So the issue is enforcing one ecosystem to ensure that all of them, including Included telephone that you don't take it. How can for, for God heaven's sake? How a criminal is talking? We are still having challenge of one identity. If we have one NIN number, where you make sure the person who has a passport is the same person who has driver license, the same person who has GSM. How can you call for uh, bandit, bandit use telephone to, to collect ransom? So it's just to enforce this system, uh, one ecosystem where everything will tie it together. If law enforcement come across a person who has a driver license, they put his driver license, they will see his name number, they will see his password, they will see his telephone number. They don't need to ask anybody. If they come across him with a telephone number, they put his telephone number, they will see all his data. It's not easy for such people to commit crime. That's how it works globally. Uh, so you don't need to have one single data, but you need to have connectivity with all identity databases into one base database in NEMC. Okay, 
Okay, let's just move away uh, from uh, immigration and security and all of that, and let's talk politics. I mean, after a fashion, most uh, uh, uniformed personnel, when they leave office, as you have done, uh, the next preoccupation is to just drop the full, uh, uniform and wear barbaric and join politics. Are you making that transition too? <laughs> I know that's a personal question, but where I'm actually going, I want your comment on the current political process <coughs> in the country. Do you have any concerns about the transition towards 2023 and what we have seen so far? Uh, first, as a citizen of Nigeria, and who is no longer a public service, I have the right to join politics, the right of association as enshrined in the constitution. So, as I drop my uniform, uh, I have the right to join any politics, any political group, I can do that. But you have not seen me contesting. Uh, last, this very year, I tweeted, uh, and it brought a lot of controversy that I would not want. Many people thought I would contest for Jigao State Governorship. Rumors were there in social media, they showed my picture. But, uh, I realized that it is not good for you after you spend 36 years doing one profession, to just jump into another profession without learning. So I'm learning from them to see their tricks, their games before I join them. But the best way to serve is for you to be in politics, to serve the people genuinely. Uh, we need genuine politicians who can contribute to effective change in this country. Uh, and it's not only one person. Initially, we thought one person can change the world. We need many hands to change. One person, President Buhari, as we can see, we cannot change Nigeria alone. We need good governors. Uh, people forgot that politics is a grassroots. You need good governors. You need good local government chairmen to effect these changes. Uh, one person in Abuja cannot make this change alone. So uh, as far as I'm concerned, I have the right to join any politics. I have not told you my political party, but I have the right to join. Uh, well, the current political system is on. Uh, election has started. New election uh, act uh, re regulation is on. Uh, primaries have been carried out. Uh, we need. We, we hope it will go fine. My only worries, concern I have is that there are a lot of arms in the hands of criminals. Uh, during 23 election uh, in all locations in the country uh, we have kidnapping banditry in northwest we have uh, Boko Haram in northeast we have kidnapping military in north central we have uh, uh, IPOP in southeast we have uh, Niger Delta in south south uh, southwest uh, uh, agitation has a little bit gone down but it's a serious issue when you have a lot of arms in the hands of criminals it is very dangerous free and democratic system. So government must invest as quickly as possible to make sure they move up these arms from the hands of people because they are capable of killing people. We have incidents where uh, INEC people have, were arrested, were attacked under gun button. Uh, that is very serious. Uh, that's the second concern. Uh, the second concern I have is money. A lot of money has been shared uh, in all the political parties to select people. is very dangerous. More money than before. Uh, and that is very dangerous. If dollars will go in high, such a number to select people, how can genuine people who want to serve, who doesn't have dollar, participate? Uh, it means Nigeria must review the process of leadership building. In countries like China, uh, I'm not a communist, you build leaders right from the beginning. You know, If you come to a factory, you employ 10 people in a factory to work, you begin to look who is capable of providing that leadership. You provide nursing that person to grow. But in Nigeria, you can't lose anybody because the selection is the dollar you give. So the criminals will have more dollars than the right people. As long as you don't have a process to select a good leader who can serve the country, the end result will be very dangerous for Nigeria. So I need to, we need to rethink. We need to shape our process of leadership selection so that money would not be the key issue for selecting. Uh, as long as that continues, it's very dangerous for Nigeria. Right. So as a man, okay, that has... Uh... You know, you, you have uh, some fair bit of a panoramic view in this country. You are a citizen now. For 36 years of your life, you went through the customs. I mean, through the immigration, you rose to the highest echelon. Uh, you've been in, you know, both, both areas as a citizen and as a uniformed person in this country. And as a senior citizen, like, like you said, you're taking a panoramic view of your life in Nigeria. What scares you the most about this country? And what gives you sleepless nights? I think what is scared me about this country, this country is always at the edge, but it never tilts. <laughs> it's, it's a very, it's, it's, you know, I, I had opportunity to serve as an attache in Germany for five years, 91. And in 92, 93, I was hearing rumors when I was in Germany that Nigeria would hopefully be eliminated. It would not be more. 
But the miracle of this country is that it is always in the tillage and always trying to go down, always trying to survive. Uh, I think what we should know as citizens, this country is great. Uh, we have a lot of resources. People even don't know the mineral and human resources we have in this country. It's enormous. I'm telling you, if there's a country that one should be proud to look for it to grow, it is Nigeria. I swear there is no country like Nigeria with human and natural resources. We just need the leadership to package it properly to succeed. We will be the greatest country in the world. Uh, I hope we should the leaders who will do it. We cannot, unfortunately, the change cannot come from the grass. If I try to be a good guy, another one try to be good, we need somebody who will drive us by force to change Nigeria. We need strong legislation and compliance by law to make sure everybody follows the law so that Nigeria will be better for all of us. I have hope for Nigeria. And I, I don't love any country. I am not going to change my citizenship. I'm not a person who is going to look for a citizenship elsewhere. Uh, no, my children have that encouraged. So I say always stay at home. So the hope for Nigeria is great, Ruben. Uh, you have freedom. You make more noise than Nigeria than any country in Africa. Uh, media has freedom to talk. The social media is crazy with the hate speech and many things happening, uh, which doesn't happen in any part of the world. It's a very interesting country. But I hope Nigeria will be better if we get leaders who can be able to change Nigeria. Little discipline. Little discipline will change. So the property above the law, you see this happen when Every day I drive out, believe me, I see the tension on the road. I see that everybody is on his own, everybody does what he wants. A disciplined country will be a great country. I think some people are jealous about that and they're helping us to be chaotic. All right, thank you so much, I mean, uh, We're proud uh, and we know things can only get better in this country. Thank you so much.